Hello, my name is Malika Basdab. Welcome to PM Express. It was built to be a 10-hour grueling encounter dominated by heated exchanges and technical legal jargons. In the end, it lasted for just a little over six hours with neither controversy nor drama. It nonetheless brought out the usually quiet, graceful Supreme Court judge commenting on sensitive national issues. I'm talking about the vetting of Justice Sophia Kufu, nominated by the president as Ghana's next chief justice. She answered questions from admissions into the law school and had decisions on the infamous Munche 3. Were you impressed by the vetting? Could the questions have been better? Did she acquit herself creditably in your view? When I come back from the break, I will introduce my guest, a crack team of lawyers who will provide all the answers. Keep watching. With the um, with the uh, contempt case, contempt of court is not intended to gag anybody. Contempt of courts, the, its focus is on the protection of the uh, sanctity and integrity of the judicial process. It's, it's intended to protect the process itself, not even the individuals who, got, who were offended. No, it is to protect the institution because, um, uh, excuse me, um, honorable uh, legislators, at the end of the day, it is when the justice system breaks down. That's when a nation breaks down. And if, if there are countries without legislators, they, they manage. There are countries with uh, dubious uh, executive structures, they manage. So long as there's something they can call the judiciary. If there's no ju judiciary, then we are back in the, in the jungle. Thank you. is what you do about neg the negative uh, impressions. Some of it you address by, by making, making your processes and procedures more open and more known, better known to the public so that it does not seem like you're working some hocus pocus or some magic. Also, it is important that where discipline of the internal players, internal players being the, the, the judiciary or for that matter, the judicial service staff, where disciplinary issues arise, those also need to be dealt with, uh, uh, with, with without any favoritism and without any selectivity and uh, in an open and transparent manner so that those outside know that something is being done and uh, those inside know that something is being done and will be done if they also uh, breach any of the of the rules. I'm not one of those who subscribes to um, the Ghana School of Law being scrapped. What happens in the universities? What happens in the universities at the faculties of law is that they they educate people academically on, 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 on the law as, as a theory, on knowledge of the law. That is what faculties of law do. The Ghana School of Law is a professional training 
lack of facility, let's put it that way. And that is where the theories learned in classroom are supposed to be taught from a pra more practical point of view. And uh, when the, and that is how it has been. When we, when I was, when we were in, in, in law school, in fact, it was such a seamless transition that some of us actually thought that the Ghana School of Law was part of the University of Ghana. But when you're doing the more practical uh, subjects, you're, you're doing, instead of just the theory of, uh, of, 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 of procedure, you're doing the practice of how to draw up um, a charge. And, and you're supposed to be also taught how you're going to marshal the evidence to support that charge, and so on and so forth. The the current the the, the current the, the, because there has been the beginnings of uh, a reform system. To make you are welcome back. You are watching PM Express. You just watched excerpts of the submissions by the uh, nominee for Chief Justice Justice Sofia Kufu when she met the Appointments Committee of Parliament. There are those who believe that the entire vetting process. Um, was a bit disappointing. I don't know if my guests agree or disagree. My guest um, to my immediate left is Dr. Poké Dise. He is Senior Lecturer, University of Ghana Law School. Doc, welcome. And of course, next to him is Kojuga Adawudu, Private Legal Practitioner. Gentlemen, welcome. It's a pleasure. Let me start with Doc. Do you agree with those who say this vetting was below pi, was below their expectations. Well, uh, good evening. I, I believe those who hold that viewpoint mm -hmm. uh, think that the vetting is supposed to achieve a result that is extraordinary. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, with the kind of practice that the woman had been exposed to all these years at the bench and as a lawyer, I don't think uh, anyone should expect anything different from, from what actually occurred. Some of the questions were pe pithy, others uh, were not so much uh, to the point. But all the same, I believe all that we are interested in is to test whether she can perform the function as a Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana. And I don't basically she could is do that it. not the problem with what Dr. Pokedad just pointed out, her pedigree, her performance, the death of her judgment, the expectations that she was going to dazzle and were reasonable, weren't they? No, I, I, I think that for me, being nominated for the office of a chief justice and all the issues that had come up with our legal education, legal issue confronting the bar, the country and the I was also expecting that six hours would have been too small. It would have gone even more than that. Because there is a lot of barrage of questions. But you could also see that the chairman of the appointment committee was actually trying to regulate the time, which did not open up more or give up more time for questions to be closed. But even within the six hours, even within the six hours, a lot could have been done. A lot of questions were asked. A lot of questions were asked. And being a lawyer, I will be satisfied with some of the questions. But those who are not lawyers felt that more questions should have been answered by her or giving more explanation, they will not understand that some of the issues that were raised were sub and some of the issues 
she felt that the decisions that had been given based on those issues were collective decision of the Supreme Court. In as much as she might have presided over some of the issues, it was not her decision. So she says that I'm not here to justify the reasons and as a lawyer, you would understand. But the non-lawyers will find it a little bit difficult because they might be expecting that more explanation would have come. Okay. Doc, have okay. he just talked about sub judicate and we heard her repeatedly say, well, this is sub judice, this is sub, -sub judice, which means this is a matter which is pending in court. In court yeah. And to that extent, she is constrained in giving um, answers or responding or commenting on those issues. Exactly. But could you have raised an issue about questions about judgments that she was part of or delivered either as a sole judge or she being a member of the panel that arrived at those decisions. And he said it was not proper for those questions to be asked. But some of those questions were asked by lawyers. Well, uh, they could be asked by lawyers. But if you know uh, the incoming chief justice, I think you should not be surprised. She's not the type who want to speak to the media often or the public in that sense. Of course, when you invite her to come and deliver a speech at your programs, uh, she will uh, attend all right uh, when, when necessary. But she's not a type who want to go out and, and comment on things which are already done and, and have already been implemented. That's not her, her making. So if a decision has been rendered, the parties have either enforced the judgment, it's, it's long past. Sometimes commenting on it may also give different interpretations to what is actually the case. You know, and years can pass, uh, and a lot of issues can also pass. So you may not have a very good, clear meaning or appreciation of what was really uh, the case about. Uh, so in that case, everything is reported. If you want to know why they, they held so, just go and read it and, and not just pick on particular cases and want her to comment on it when she's not the sole individual who took that decision. Just um, Dr. Dominic Kayune, um, immediate past deputy attorney general, who of course also taught at the school just as yourself. He was the one who first asked a question about whether the Justice of Kufu had lost sleep over a decision that she had taken on a matter before her. Wasn't that a fair question? Well, it's, it is. Uh, it's a fair question to ask. And how she responded was that um, she trusts the things that have been done. And she believed that right decisions have been taken in all circumstances. I believe the answer could have actually given indications that with the Supreme Court, it is not that they are bound necessarily by their decisions. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those few courts, because the highest court, the Constitution allows them to depart from their decisions as and when necessary. So uh, maybe the answer could have been that if any decision was given and the imports or the outcome is not very uh, favorable, the court in a later uh, kind of decision, uh, subsequent decision, take a different uh, viewpoint. For instance, we've heard of or you've read uh, Masari and Attorney General, okay. which is one of the decisions of the Supreme Court, yes. in which uh, the court held that when the president is out of the country, the he's unable to, to perform, perform his functions. functions. I mean, if you tell, realize that it was a purposive approach to interpretation which had gone away. And for that reason, if uh, the court is differently constituted, it may have to have a, a second look at it. And the results the may have been different. Yeah, in the light of um, happiness now with technology and everything, where you can be interacting with the president and even bring him home to uh, your gadgets to, to interact with. So I think that is where maybe the questioner was expecting the questionnaire to uh, approach the issue from. But she said, is smiling. I, I trust, <laughs> I trust uh, the decisions that have been made. And she actually it. thought about it for a while. Of course. And then yeah. she said, um, no, she doesn't think she's lost sleep over any matter. Yeah. Did you think it was a, a sincere <laughs> response? Yes, um, I would say this. You know, just to 
as a follow up to his the mm -hmm. Asai yeah, versus Asai the Asai Attorney yes. General. Yeah. You see, when the president's out of the country, he's unable to perform his function. But the suggestions of the time has clearly rubbished that decision in the sense that we saw the president uh, commissioning the or giving instrument of appointment to the foreign minister mm -hmm. when they were outside in Ethiopia. Country. In Ethiopia. Yes. When he was performing his duty as the president. So it flies in the face of this decision. But it's not a constitutional I'm, 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 provision. I'm coming. Mm -hmm. It only goes to reinforce the point that as a Supreme Court or as a court, you look at the sect of facts, look at the historical antecedents, the social settings within mm -hmm. the country, and they craft their judgments. So what happens, so that is why they will tell you that Every case must be determined on its own merits. Merit. So the circumstances that prevailed, that is where they also take decision as a maybe a stopgap measure or make sure that this is the position we need to take. That's why the constitution, even in its, its own wisdom, the framework, says that any decision taken by the Supreme Court can be reversed by the same Supreme, Supreme Court. So it tells you that they mm. are the gatekeepers to look at the circumstances and says that the way things are going, this is the position or the law we are going to put. Because it is not bound at by no time, decisions. Yes, at another time, we will look at the circumstances, the economic situation, social, historical. So that it brings about that national cohesion. So that it shifts everybody into line. And talking so, up. So yes. it, it will tell you that looking at the decision that she that was given, which she said that look, upon her side, if she thinks about it, she thinks it was a right decision in the Muntia King. She thinks that look, that decision was taken so that the tension and everything within the society or the, the nation time. at that time who have been brought to an end. And it's great you have raised this. Yes. Were you surprised that from the minority members of the Appointments Committee of Parliament, virtually every single one of them asked questions relating to Munti <laughs> Yeah, you know why? The Munti mm -hmm. it has always been the position of the minority that we respected what the court had said. By convicting the people, sentencing them is respected. The judiciary has done its job. The court has finished its job. The lawyers saw an opportunity within the constitution and says that you can petition the president and the president exercises his constitutional prerogative. prerogative. So the president has exercised his prerogative by remitting the sentence. Whether it was right or wrong, posterity will judge. That was why when the question was asked, she says that it has been a matter that decision has been taken. So I'm not going to answer this matter. For me, I believe that she could have gone to explain whether the president had that constitutional right, but uh, or did not have that. I think case. I think that or the, that was a slap in the face. I think of the an initial. avalanche of all the questions, the majority yeah. of them, did not actually border on the aftermath of the decision. Many of the questions were actually seeking to impugn the decision in itself. And I, I mean, if I may come in, I I think, I mean, the looking at that decision. And also considering the fact that an aspect of the same matter uh, bordering on the powers of the president to remit the sentences of the persons uh, when uh, they've been convicted based on just an inherent powers of the Supreme Court, 
it's, it's a matter which is pending before the Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, I know two cases have been filed and have been consolidated and, and is pending uh, before the Supreme Court. In that case, um, she will be restrained in terms of how she can comment on, on, on the case. And I think that's exactly what she, she did. But my point is, was it curious for you that the minority consistently asked her questions about this matter? Even when <laughs> she said that she had presided over this matter, if the matter is done, she, she's constrained in commenting, commenting on, on it further. And yet because the questions the, Her coming. whole reasoning was in that judgment. So if you want any further explanation, go and read that judgment and get it. You know, it's, uh, as we say, uh, where you, you feel comfortable with, uh, where you think you are, what you are excited about, is what we excite you and for you to, to continue to hammer. Mm -hmm. It's an area that uh, the minority is interested in uh, <laughs> because it's an issue that concerned and touched them uh, last year. So that's where they wanted to explore that further. Yeah. Not commenting on the it. reason why the minority would really want to go into that mm -hmm. is to know whether after the court has given judgment, and the president has exercised his constitutional right, whether he was right or wrong. Now, just oppose that with when the Delta Force members have gone to court to disrupt proceedings in court. Which also came up. Yes, it came up. Now, in these circumstances, you see, it's we are all talking about the law of contempt. It is not to exonerate or glorify any person it's about the sanctity of the choir of the court now it was the judiciary itself that took it upon themselves that let's invite them and punish them no way nobody has grudge with the supreme court to say that they do not have that power they have the power of district court Circuit court, high court, right now. So they can exercise any power at any time. Now, there have been conflicting procedure when it comes to contempt. One position, it says that if there is any matter against the judiciary, then the attorney general would have to start the process of contempt. Mm -hmm. But in the Muntier case, it was the judiciary itself that hauled the people and punished them. Which is within the law. Within the law. Yeah. And they are saying that we waited for the attorney general to take action. We didn't see that. So we took the action ourselves. Now the minority is also interested to find out with the Delta Force going into court, that is a contemptuous behavior. And if it is contemptuous, Will the Attorney General institute a contentious action or the judiciary itself will harm the people? As it did in the case. As it did in the case. Of is, is, that not, is, is, that not, is that not a difference in the, the nature of contempt and the rank, the standing of the court, the kinds of powers that the Supreme Court has to take the decision that it took and to act in the manner that it did in the case of Muntier III, the court in Kumasi does not have that power and couldn't have done that, could it? Well, I want to approach it from uh, about two or three ways. First, uh, comparing the two, I think, is um, misinformation in that for the unfortunate incidents that occurred in Kumasi, in the circuit court, the persons allegedly involved were picked or they were being investigated by the police and except that the identification process could not be completed and eventually they had to be uh, discharged so efforts were made to apprehend anyone who was involved in those acts which is distinguishable from what happened in the case of the Muntier the three. no effort whatsoever was made and uh, they were clear threats which were aimed at judges names were mentioned and uh, no, if no action is being taken, because the BNI even came out and issued a statement uh, to say that 
they don't think is is an an, an actionable kind of um, they, they didn't have the capacity to carry out what exactly. they threatened. How they decided it and determined it um, on their own, I I didn't know. So that is different. In this case, an action had been taken and is still being investigated. In the event that any evidence comes out that this were the persons that stormed the, the premises, they will be charged and then processed for court. The other aspect also is that the courts are different. I mean, uh, we have two levels of courts in Ghana. We have the superior courts and then the lower courts, or some call them the inferior courts. And um, here is the case, the circuit court, it was a lower court. So um, the judge, even if the judge is able to identify any of the, the persons, and it will be difficult to identify any of those persons, guys who stormed the court. Yes, it will be very difficult to identify them. So the identification issue is a challenge. I mean, it's also going to play out. Uh, the Supreme Court, the people who did uh, engage in this program, they were easily identifiable, and came out with those uh, uh, egregious uh, utterances were known, and and also they came and never denied that those were their voices. So it was easy to identify them. So even if the circuit court judge could identify that these are the people, um, how is she going to proceed on the basis of contempt? Because they don't have powers of contempt. Uh, then uh, it may have to then be coming to a higher court for the process to be um, gone through. So those are the differences we have in, in the two scenarios. And, and could you, the, the one of the things that the minority sought to point out, and this was actually led by uh, Alaji Mutaka Mubarak, MP for Asawasi, he was trying to draw parallels in terms of the, the level of punishment. And he cited the uh, Atubiga case, and he cited Sami Wuku, and he cited Sir John. And he sought to say that the Supreme Court itself had found these guys guilty and sentenced them. The point he was making is those sentences were milder compared to what was imposed on the Muntie three. And his point was there appeared to be a certain discrimination in terms of the, the levels of punishments that were imposed. He had the point, didn't he? No. Yes, let me, before I answer your question, you see, the lower court, because for the benefit of the education of all the public, a district court or circuit court, which we term lower court, do not have the power to commit anybody for contempt. It has to be the high court or the superior courts. So when the superior court sat, it has the power of the high court, has the power of court of appeal, and has its own power, Supreme Court. So they had the power to commit. So the lower court cannot, unless the lower court makes a complaint to, to the higher court, the superior court. That is why either the court itself or the attorney general makes mm -hmm. that. Now, when it comes to the question as to the level of punishment or the degree of punishment that was meted out to someone in Wuku and others, content is, the punishment has never been stated in any statute. It's the discretion of the court looking at the circumstances, looking at the timing when things happen, and I would say that at the time that the Muntier three were punished, it was a time in the history of this nation that, look, we were sitting on tenter foot. We were approaching elections. And when it comes to elections, let me use my word advisedly. Reasoning flies out. But when it comes to religion, politics, nobody wants to see reason to prevail. They it's emotion. It's emotions. So the circumstances so were different. Yes, the circumstances were different. It was there, in my personal opinion, I believe that the Supreme Court at that time wanted to set some deterrent for people to know that, look, this nation, we will not allow it to be taken or taken as ransom 
my people to say anything. And we want to teach them to show that we are dealing with rule of law. What you are saying to me appears a very strong justification for the degree of the fines that were imposed and the prison sentences that were imposed. When you juxtapose that again against the hue and cry at the time, which then led to the president's hands being tied and he being forced to remit the sentences, there's a certain incoherence and contradictions. <laughs> no, no, you see, so when this was done by the court, the lawyers for the accused persons, the people who were sentenced. Who ought to have appreciated the, 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 the issues the way you appreciate the, the, them? The, the, the issues at that time, looking at the environment, the setting, felt that, look, the people had been remorseful. They have apologized. We think that even if they have done all this and they are remorseful, the punishment should not be as harsh and excessive as that. So they found a way within the Constitution which says that it grants the, pe the president the power that he can exercise. And they took advantage of the constitutional provisions that they have sent. It was in the wisdom of the president and the council of state, which you have to refer to, because that's a, a mechanism you need to go through. Some I doubt, believe, some doubt <laughs> that. <laughs> I no. believe it was in the wisdom of council of state, whether the council of state was right or wrong, posterity would just. So they gave the green light and says that, we have looked at it, we think that the punishment was harsh. The punishment was excessive. So, Mr. President... So, get the president to intervene. You can go on, intervene, and the and, president... And undo what the, the, no, the, 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 the justices did. The you see, don't, don't let us forget that what the president did was not a judicial power. It was a constitutional power given to him as a president. What the court did... The exercise of which exercise was the frontal. Power. Against the judiciary, isn't it? It's a power that has been given to him. So if as human beings or Ghanaians, citizens, we think that that power that we have granted to the president is too excessive, is too hard. Doc, some say, know, we I, need to look at some that. Say that was discretionary think, power which was think, not uh, exercised with discretion. Actually, I don't think the powers that we gave to the president under the constitution are unlimited. Give that prerogative or exercise the prerogative of mercy is applicable to situations that we are talking about. It doesn't apply to situations of when the Supreme Court Suo Motu decides to convict someone for contempt based on his inherent powers. And we want to limit it at that point because it's a matter that will be pronounced yes, upon yes, by, yes. by the Supreme Court. Yeah. You know, coming back to why some have gotten various degrees of sentencing, I mean, if you read scholarship on sentencing, you will realize that uh, you may commit the same offense as, as human beings, as Ghanaians, and at the end of the day, get different sentences and, and different terms in, in prison. Or even if it's a fine, you can get a different one. Here's the case that warnings upon warnings have been given to other persons who have either misspoken or uh, not spoken properly. Um, against the judicial system mm -hmm. and they've been given some punishment. Then you go a step further to not only speak against the whole system but start picking on individual judges. So it's as if, okay, so all these things that we've been telling you, you haven't learned any lesson. At some point in sentencing, if you realize that you have had the uh, prior information or advice and then disregarded those information all this while, you will be given the deterrence that uh, you have to uh, get by, by a judge Sh or by the sentencing should, body. Should Justice Sofia Kufu have brought closure to this matter by speaking to it? No, because uh, the matter is pending in court. Uh, she could be involved. Uh, for instance, when it gets to the panel, if they've not already done it, uh, she will be doing it under her tenure. You don't want to invite a lot of these uh, uh, 
pressures upon yourself as, as a new uh, CJ. The other bit also is that uh, because other judges are also going to sit on it, it's, it, won't, it won't be fair for you to give commentaries and then it's as if their hands are tied uh, for whatever they can, can adjudicate it over. And the other aspect also is that it's a matter which you have finished delivering your judgment in. Oh. Okay. Just leave the rest to lie and not let uh, politicians drag you into it because they, were, they are interested in it. That's what they, they feed And on. it was so obvious, wasn't <laughs> it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you don't want to feed them. And then the next uh, day or two, all the news will be about Munje 3 and what we said and what we didn't say. So it was the right time. Hold your breath. We have to take a break at this point. When we come back, you're watching PM Express. When we come back, we'll be talking about some of the issues that she responded to. Admission into Ghana Law School, ju justice system, justice delayed, justice denied, and she added anyone. When we come back, we will answer all the questions. Keep watching. You're welcome by your watching PM Express. And we are talking the vetting of uh, Chief Justice nominee, Justice Sophia Kufu, and the answers she gave when she met with the Appointments Committee of Parliament, my guests are Justice Dr. Puke Duse and uh, Kujoga Adawudu. Um, I hope the justice didn't apply. <laughs> 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 maybe, maybe we are sending them. Maybe you know what is going on. <laughs> they don't give me titles. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. So, um, one of the issues that actually also dominated the, her vetting was admissions into the law school. And rightly, it dominated the discussions. I remember when uh, the deputy attorney, gen attorney general appeared before the appointments committee, this matter dominated again. And today, it dominated again. Were you satisfied, let me start with you, uh, Adawudu, with her responses to the, this hydra-headed problem of admissions into the uh, Ghana School of Law? No, 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 I wasn't satisfied. It's become a real issue for people to have access to the law school, especially getting to the professional stage. And we are no more like the population we used to have. Legal education has become very attractive. And a lot of people want to have Because access everyone to wants to look exquisite like yourselves. Because people think that when they see lawyers, lawyers, they are rich. <laughs> but when you start to practice, you realize that it is not as how I see it. But his pockets <laughs> in his office. It, it it costs but, but, but you see, that's uh, an issue. But I understood her as a lawyer why she could not express herself on this matter. Because it's become an issue which is pending in court. Now, the courts and the judges will tell you that if there is a matter pending before us, you don't go to the public discussing the merits and the merits of that matter. And it will be a bad precedent for her who is going to assume the position of a chief justice to be seen to be doing the vice versa, to be speaking on a matter which is pending so she was hurt within some constraints and difficulties. That's why she could not express herself. But when it comes to the management, where she's the administrative head of the That's judiciary. a general legal counsel. Yeah, okay, she's yeah, a member yeah. of the general legal she's council. Yeah, she's actually the and head actually of the And actually, she's been the chair of the disciplinary committee of the yeah, of of general, general legal council. Yes. But if she comes as the administrative head, when okay. you go to Article 125, administrative head of the judiciary. What I was expecting is that as the managerial head of that institution, she should have been able to explain and tell people, because it is believed in management perspectives that a leader of an organization determines the 50% success of that and organization. The direction. Your vision, your philosophy, and how you go, it's what would drive the team to rally around you that you achieve. But being a lawyer as she is, she was constrained to explain. But is that. she inherently conservative? I think so. And um, 
It's also because of the nature of the job. And if you are not, you may run into troubles. Uh, because you are here today with uh, someone uh, cracking jokes, speaking freely, and then the next day there's a matter affecting a relative of that person or that kind of thing. So that's how uh, they operate. I mean, they operate within the constraints of, of the profession and how the, the bench works. Uh, coming to the legal education in Ghana, I think it's, it's, um, it's challenged significantly. Uh, it's on the brink of a, a near national disaster. Uh, you know, we have two levels. The academic level and then the professional level. And when he finishes, I'll tell you my own experience with him. Uh, I'm not sure he remembers. <laughs> I'm not sure he remembers. Uh, I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so um, there are several faculties, I mean, that we call it, the academic institutions, reading um, LLBs, so allowing people to read LLBs, and churning out uh, 1,000, uh, 2,000 students uh, or graduates uh, a year. I believe the numbers will continue to shoot up. But come to think of the professional angle, when it's actually the vision of every person who is enrolling a uh, law school or program to go to uh, the law school and then become, and become a lawyer. A lawyer. Uh, mainly, people just don't want the LLB and leave it there. So if you get about 2,000 students uh, or candidates writing the exams this year, and then think of about 400 or 300 or 250. That's the space you have. Yeah, for the three campuses across the country. Uh, it's a challenge, and it's going to compound over the years because uh, every year there will be a backlog. Last year we had about uh, 700 to 800 backlog. They will be added to, to this, this year, year to go and write. Next year the number will shoot up to about okay. 3,000. No, what is the problem? You you teach in the school. Well, the what problem is the problem? For, I mean, we at, I mean, at Legon, we control our numbers. Um, every year normally we don't produce more than 120 students. And talking about controlling the numbers in 2011, I sat the entrance exams. There were 1,300, <laughs> and about 306 of us were shortlisted for the interview into the faculty at the time. And I appeared before him um, and others for the interview. And then afterwards, when the list came, 124, my name was not there. Malik, let me tell you, you my experience. <laughs> when, when I got there, I, I was, after I was, that, they I told me that I was a borderline <laughs> candidate. So oh, I you, should be. You were told that? No, no. I think that because we, then we, I said, we don't know, we don't assign reasons uh, no, no, that way. No, no, <laughs> I didn't find my name. <laughs> and I said they said I was a borderline candidate. So <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm sure I'll find my name somewhere. There, somewhere. So you know, but when you looked at it, it's a huge problem. We need to confront it. You see, the I understand, you know, maybe because I'm a lawyer. The standard at the faculty and even the law school would have to be maintained. You don't want people who come out of law school will not be able to do the petty, you know, the regiments of the law to be able to give an opinion. You definitely have to go through the training. But it's becoming, you know, you, know, you need people to train. The space and uh, I think the thinking that comes in is that look, we should follow the trend of the ACCA professional exams. You can have your training anywhere, write the exams or go through apprenticeship. You write the exams. If you pass, if you are qualified, then you get called to the bar. Then you get called to the bar. I think we are getting there. Will it? Because listen, it had happened. Philip Acha become one of the distinguished chief justice we've ever had in this country. They were the people who went through pupillage, you know, apprenticeship. Then they realized that these guys were good. You just heard, we just <laughs> heard the, 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 the chief justice nominee yeah, she at her vetting uh, say she, she doesn't, doesn't subscribe to the that. scrapping of the, the Ghana School of I Law. Mean, that's, that's what... Uh, no, no, I think most of the her answers when Tony issues, controversial issues came, 
She was like, we need to subject that to debate. But this one, she, no, stayed, this one, she, she said, said she categorically really support that she doesn't subscribe uh, to the staffing of the Ghana ACCA School of Law. Like she doesn't. Kind of examination. And that is a case pending before them. And I think, uh, uh, it, it's, I it's mean, it may not happen uh, yeah. I mean, during her tenure, but in the long term, you have to think of how to absorb more people, how to move beyond having few structures at uh, Gimpa, at uh, Makola, uh, and at TNU West, or uh, 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 parasite campuses as the host, I mean, as institutions to train uh, lawyers. So that if we have a professional body handling that, I think it will be the uh, best way out, and then we can get more people to come on board. You but coming to your, your, uh, your, your number, 124, uh, you know now the numbers are even 70, um, every year for post first degree. So, uh, if you place 125 at that time, you did very well. And <laughs> I, I, I appeared before them, just uh, uh, what's the name? Uh, Professor Kofi Kumado was there, and he <laughs> dealt with me because I was a, I, I appeared as a journalist. And I think he asked me a question whether Ghanaian journalists have contributed to the development of Ghana's democracy. And then I started talking talking, talking, and then Good long Professor, Professor Kumado just said, a hey, young man, you are very eloquent, but you are talking too much. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you, you know, he gave me a lecture. No, no, but you know what? You see, my experience in the law school, and he is teaching there. You see, everybody who goes to the law school thinks that I'm brilliant, wants to show off. But with the training of the law is to break all those airs around you that you go through the rudiment they make you feel that you are so stupid you're nobody you're nobody you don't know anything that is when you start to appreciate the position of the law it, you know so it's a normal thing I've, nobody has ever gone to law school and feels like oh, i don't i want to quit it happens to everybody and i think that is something that is and written nobody is told so you know i always tell people who want to go there these, these people have seen it all they don't want you to come and impress them and say that look i know this i want to impress that i know everything that happens no you they know in in, in uh, the know, first year so yes. time they, they come you know in the class these days for the uh, shs batch mm -hmm. you realize that if we are taking 60 normally we take around 60 and then the post first degree around 70 students. And in that class, 60, mm, 25, 30, yeah. maybe from Wesley girls. That kind of thing. You see, that's yeah. how. So if you went to, uh, I don't know this school you went. <laughs> 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 I, I went to St. Dimas Senior uh, High School. No, there, if you have no <laughs> classmates, <laughs> <in that class. laughs> there's no classmates. <laughs> in the, in the graduate from St. Dimas in, in the first year. So then I. You realize that it's just a coalescence of intelligence and it's not <laughs> smartness. So I tell them, I mean, all of you, you were in the top three or five of your class mm -hmm. from the beginning to wherever mm -hmm. I, I yeah. mean. But you come and meet them, I guess, you know. So at that point, you realize if you are not careful, you start asking yourself, am I the same person <laughs> who, when I was young, was giving all the awards? And mm -hmm. and then um, it's now like, it's, I'm doubt. straddling uh, C's and D's. Yes, it's some, you. Some doubt. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's how it is. It's, it's that uh, uh, key. <laughs> <Interesting. I mean, laughs> eventually, when you get out, you know, and when you start reading the cases, you realize that you are drawing a lot of lessons from it. You start re uh, doing um, tort law, and then you are going around, people who are committing assault, battery, all over. You are seeing, oh, this is assault, this is battery. You go to the village, people are fighting and insulting each other, and then you remember cases you have read in Wenchu and Redua, and where <laughs> some. <laughs> ah, but this one, someone did it and fell, I mean, I mean was in trouble by, by this decision, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So you realize that you were in what I normally call the Socratic cave. So in that cave, it was like a complete darkness. So coming out of that darkness, you realize that there's light at the end of the tunnel, out of it. So until you get into that legal community, you are in total darkness. It, it, it can really cause a lot of pain. Oh, yeah. A lot of pain. Uh, you, uh, you talk to students and a lot, a lot of them regret going to the law school. <laughs> it's, it's, it's tedious. It, it, it's, I've always told people that it's not about intelligence. It's about consistency. It's about getting 
the act and always make sure what you are doing is repetitive so that you study it what you have been given you go to but if you believe that you were you know, as I smart thought, at some point i thought i was intelligent <laughs> until i got lost and then you <laughs> met <laughs> like that. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is not a place, you, you know. Oh. But I thought that I was intelligent and smart. Okay, we are it is about that, you know. And for me, the psychological thing is to remold you to appreciate the law from so, the so sociological. That you can be yes. I'm told we have thirty seconds, so I'll split it fifteen fifteen. Yeah. What kind of chief justice do you expect uh, Justice of Ayakufu to be? I expect her, as she has said, that she will provide quality justice, effective justice, and she has also asked that financial independence should be granted within the two years. There should be a legacy she will leave that we can see that really when she came within the short period, she achieved, she that. Changed, she no. achieved that. From what I know of her and, and what she's lived all this while, she's a disciplinarian and you expect there to be discipline. a lot of discipline in the judiciary dr poker this in the judiciary the legal community thank you thank you dr poker this is a senior lecturer at the um, law school at the university of ghana and uh, i have been having a chat with him and kojoga adawudu um a private legal practitioner if you like my shirt you should call latida uh, they are those who brought me this beautiful shirt and others 0204 is their number my name is Mari kabaz w you have been watching pm express god willing will bring you another exciting edition of the show until then bye bye